Um, as I said at the outset, we're going to do four things. We're going to look at the paradigm or the template or even um, more accurately the instinct of looking at the Auschwitz story as the paradigm with which we understand the modern state of Israel. We will look at Sinai. We will look at um, the, the critiques from within our tradition about why neither of these instincts uh, accurately reflects uh, our aspiration in talking about Jewish sovereignty. And we'll try at the end to put these pieces together and try to imagine uh, 30 years after 1982 and when the article was first written, what it means to hold these two ideas, these two instincts of Auschwitz and Sinai in productive and useful tension with one another. I should say one more comment just as an intro, which is, Obviously, I think this goes without saying, but I want to be, I want to be uh, respectful. That the language of Auschwitz, as it's used here, um, and as we use in this lecture, um, is obviously a stand-in for an ideology. Uh, and should not be meant as a disrespectful casting of the actual experience of Auschwitz itself. Um, we'll come back to unpacking that uh, because part of the challenge um, for all of us as contemporary Jews in thinking about the impact of Auschwitz in our collective memory is that the very experience and understanding of what Auschwitz means is fundamentally different for those of us who uh, not only ha did not live through it but could not have lived through it, uh, and one of the things we'll have to think about is the, the same metaphor of that to the experience of the Jewish people going into the land of Israel, which is fundamentally, which is entirely people who could not have lived through Yitziat Mitzrayim. So we'll have to, I want to be respectful in the language of Auschwitz in acknowledging the particular experience of survivors, even as we have to use an interpretive language to think about what that means for those of us who could not, not possibly have been the survivors of that experience. I gave you two ideas to look at in the first three sources in understanding the Auschwitz consciousness or this Auschwitz paradigm, and they are as follows. The first text that I gave you, and I wanted you to see the original for which Rashi is expounding on because it's unbelievably surprising to see how the rabbis interpret what seems to be an unequivocally positive encounter between Yaakov and Esav years after their, um, the feud that they had, which could have resulted in the two of them living out a life of a total blood feud for the rest of their existence. As you remember, at the beginning of this story, um, before we hit this pasuk, Yaakov and Esav, having not seen each other for a long time, are about to encounter one another, now both of them with full flocks and families. And um, as we've studied in previous summers here at the Machon, the famous midrash about Yaakov in a, in where he's about to encounter Esav is that the, ver the text gives us two verbs, that Yaakov was both, both scared and fearful. And why was he both scared and fearful, the rabbis ask? Why would you repeat these verbs? Because he was scared of what Esav was going to do to him, but he was equally scared of what he was going to do to Esav, that power and powerlessness are actually flip sides of the same coin. And there's all this anxiety building up into this encounter between Yaakov and Esav, which ends either climactically or anticlimactically with what says in the Pasuk, which is, Vayaratz Esav li krato, Esav runs at him, which again, we're, we're supposed to imagine is a source of excitement and anxiety. What will Esav do in this moment? Vayichab kehu, he embraced him. Vayipola tzavarav, vayishakehu, vayivku. He fell on his neck, um, they embraced, they kissed, and they both cried. And in that crying is the, the release of all of the tension that has been building up about what this encounter is going to consist of. And we can imagine upon reading this verse, that the lesson of this is that the fear was in some sense uh, unfounded. Right? They were scared of what they were going to do to each other, but it turns out that since they were brothers from the womb, and even though they lived in all of this productive tension with each other for all of their childhoods, that at the end of the day they were still family. Nevertheless, the rabbis in the Midrash, which Rashi cites, actually read this opposite to what the verse actually connotes. The embrace, the love that they feel to one another, according to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the Midrash, is actually misleading. It turns out that the embrace that they have is actually not the true reflection of their relationship. The true reflection of their relationship is that they will always despise one another. That this kissing and embracing did not reflect that we and the other are fundamentally lovers, but we and the other fundamentally hate, despise, and live in fear of one another, as the, as the Midrash says. And here, in order to find it, the Midrash has to not look at the verse itself. It has to look at the text itself. For those of you who looked at it in the original in the Hebrew, this is one of these places in the Tanakh where there are um, decorative dots on top, of the ver on top of this pasuk. 
very strange script, uh, scribal phenomenon that there are dots on top all over the, the Hebrew words of this pasuk. If you're a rabbi reading a midrash, that is an invitation to understand what it actually is. As we know from when Rabbi Akiva um, is teaching and Moses is in his Beit Midrash and, Rabbi, and they are expounding on every jot and tittle on every word on the Bible, that each one of these things must be loaded with significance. And so what must be the loaded significance of the dots on top of this pasuk, which describes this loving relationship between Yaakov and Esav? It must be there to demonstrate that it's fundamentally misleading, that something is askew, something is wrong in the embrace between Yaakov and Esav. Rabbis say as follows, there are dots on the word. There is controversy concerning this, bright, this matter in a bright of Sifre. Some interpret the dots to mean that he did not kiss him wholeheartedly. The fact that it says he kissed him, it was actually subversively not really kissing him. He was kissing him as an act of deception, of hate, but it wasn't really a kiss of love. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, it is a well-known tradition, and here I want to use it in the Hebrew, it is a well-known tradition that Esau hates Jacob. Not that he hated Jacob, but that he hates Jacob. But that in this particular moment, his compassion was moved, to, moved, uh, was moved that he kissed him wholeheartedly. What is the subversive reading that the rabbis are offering on this kiss of Yaakov to Esav, or this kiss of Esav to Yaakov, is that don't read the fact that these two opposites embrace as a signal that we can live peacefully with our neighbors. Read it, however, that fundamentally we are despised by Esav. And that's why the present tense language is so significant. So, so significant. Esav sonel Yaakov, in a timeless sense. That whenever there is an Esav and whenever there is a Yaakov, he hates us. Now, the language of he hates us is particularly significant, not only because it introduces this timeless notion that we are always hated by them, but because it could have very credibly said, biyadua she'esav v'yakov sonim echad l'asheni. It could perfectly well have said that we hate them as much as they hate us. And here the layers of historical meaning in this Midrash are significant because Esav and Yaakov become for the rabbis not merely the biblical characters of Esav and Yaakov, but stand-ins for first, we the Jewish people are Yaakov and Esav are the Roman Empire, and later, we the Jewish people are Yaakov and Esav are the Christians who are the inheritors of the Roman Empire. This is a language of present tense historical significance for the rabbis, that they hate us. And by not making it, we hate them as much as they hate us, we become entirely the victim of their rage and their wrath. This is a problematic midrash, not only because of that overall lesson, but because who ultimately is responsible for the hatred between Yaakov and Esav? Yaakov. Right? Yaakov, maybe his mother, right? Um, Right? Yaakov and his mother are ultimately responsible for the ill will that Esav plays out towards Yaakov. One of the things that is so difficult to have as part of our tradition is the belief that our birthright, when it meant birthright, um, our birthright was, right, was ill-gotten on the basis of this slimy trick that Yaakov does towards Esav, the result of which is that we now have this almost moral stance of victimhood as articulated by this Midrash. The more, when you have a moral stance of victimhood, the only obligation that is incumbent upon you is survival of the wrath of Esav. We are, this Midrash says, fundamentally living in a state of victimhood, fundamentally living in a state of otherness that is created by their hatred towards us. This is not an invitation towards any sense of moral responsibility. It's an invitation towards living in a culture of fear. And it's hard to underplay how significant the idea of Esav Sonel Yaakov is in a Jewish moral consciousness. For many Jews throughout history and to the present, the idea that they hate us has been unbelievably essential to crafting a kind of self-definition that says we are simply at the mercy of those who hate us. And our only obligation is to survive against that hatred. We are an enemy other and is crafted by them without it being done by us.
This is played out in the vision of Jewish sovereignty in this really bizarre moment in the prophecy of Bil'am when he is invited by Balak to give a, uh, to give a, a, prof, a curse of the people of Israel. And of course, the words are turned around after the curious donkey incident. Um, the words are turned around and the words that come out are meant to be words of blessing as, a, uh, as opposed to words of curse. And yet when you read this blessing, you have to ask the question, what blessing exactly are we asking for? He took up his discourse and said, Balak the king of Moab has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east, saying, Come curse Jacob for me and come defy Israel. He says, How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I defy he whom the Lord has not defied? And then what's the vision, the first line of what it is that he's been turned around from a curse to a blessing? From the top of the rocks I see him, from the hills I behold him. And what is he? What is this people Israel? Lo, it is a people that shall dwell alone. Am levadad yishkon and not be counted among the rest of the nations of the world. The vision of sovereignty, or the vision of the Jewish people, that in the mind of the Torah is supposed to be a blessing, is one of total isolation from our neighbors. The vision that Balaam, th Balaam thinks is actually a blessing and the Torah imagines to be a blessing is a vision of a state that is essentially echoes um, the vision of Yeshayahu Leibovitch when he was asked, what is the purpose of a Jewish state? And the answer, his answer was, anybody know? That we not be killed by the Goyim. Why do we need a Jewish state? Ent entirely for the purpose, not as we'll see, of the Sinaitic mission that we are intended to use this state to amount to some lofty vision of, of Jewish sovereignty. It is not Bilam looking at the Jewish people and describing as he does in another place, Matovu Oalecha Yaakov. In this particular case, the vision is that the Jewish people are a people that fundamentally dwells alone, a fundamentally a people who lives in isolation. Now, is this, um, this is in some ways, as we'll see this at the end of our sources, there is, there is some legitimate inherent value in this notion of survival even at the cost of being alone, alone, right? There is legitimacy to what Leibovitch says when he says the right not to be slaughtered by the Goyim is a meaningful right. The same way that Bill, I'm imagining the Jewish people living alone, there is value to a people who even if it never gets along with his neighbors is allowed to survive in the region. Right? Nevertheless, when this becomes turned into a certain ideology of state, and I gave the example earlier of Netanyahu, it creates a, it creates a reality um, uh, that, that um, or this Auschwitz imagination makes virtually no moral claims on the state itself except for the legitimacy of survival. Netanyahu, I want to play it out a little bit further, is the most, and I talked to somebody in the break about this, is the most Holocaust-oriented prime minister that the State of Israel has had since Begin. The main difference being that whereas Begin was emerging at a time in Israeli history where he was essentially the, conscience, the voice of conscience for the survivor generation that had been muted for the first 30 some odd years of the state because the survivor in the State of Israel was reflective of an of a anti-Zionist reality. Right, the failure to fight back and only the ethic of survival as opposed to the ethic of, of standing up for yourself. Where Begin embodied that survivor uh, consciousness, brought the voice of the survivors into the Israeli moral vocabulary. It's, it's, it's amazing turn of events that 30 years later, Netanyahu has marshaled all of this Holocaust language to be the archetypical language, the paradigmatic language that he wants to use to describe the current state of affairs of the Jewish people. And if you'll notice, I gave the particular example of when he says that the 2006 GA, it's 1938 and Iran is Germany. In his speeches over the last 10 years, there it periodically is 1938, sometimes it's 1933, sometimes it's 1939, and sometimes it's 1941. And those are very telling. I think perhaps part of the story is that he's the son of a historian. And not only a historian, but a historian who comes out of the, the school of Esav Soneli Yaakov. He comes out of a particular school of Jewish history that is obsessed with Jewish victimhood, 
And therefore, he's very precise in the choice of, if you describe it as 1933 versus describing it in 1941, you are channeling a particular moment of the Jewish people living through the Auschwitz story, where we are at various stages of either pre-victimhood, emerging victimhood, or total victimhood. Nevertheless, any one of those myths and narratives operates within the same central paradigm that David Hartman has identified presciently 30 years before Netanyahu as this is not merely a way in which to talk about foreign policy. This is an orientation towards what the state of Israel fundamentally means, which is the right to survive and the right for this stuff not to happen to us once again. And it creates very few moral obligations on the state, except for surviving the existential threats of the Esavs, who will always hate the Yaakovs. Let me give a problematic um, footnote to this. A few years ago, um, President Obama went to Egypt and gave his most important Middle East foreign policy speech. In that foreign policy speech, for those who remember, the moment that he what, he, what did he describe as the central legitimating force of the Jewish state? The Shoah. My colleague, Yassi Klein Halevi, wrote um, an op-ed in response to it, which said, um, uh, addressed to President Obama called How to Speak Israeli. It's worth reading. And he, t he eviscerates Obama for this colossal mistake in this misreading of the Israeli consciousness of being of using the Holocaust as essentially the only or primary reason for the, for the Jewish state's legitimacy in the Middle East. Now here's an interesting moment. Why do you, why, my, my hypothesis is why does Obama go to, to Egypt and give this analogy? Because he's listening to Netanyahu. He thinks what he's supposed to do as the American president, to be empathetic to the story of the Jewish people in the Jewish state is to echo the language of the Prime Minister of the State of Israel. And yet, for whatever reason, which we could unpack in our Q&A or in our discussion or in your discussion groups, when it comes from the non-Jewish president of the United States speaking in English to the Arab states, it sounds tone deaf. It sounds like what the, the state, the Shoah is not supposed to be the entire motivation for the State of Israel. And when it comes from the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, it sounds perfectly legitimate. One reason for that might be, is that where does Prime Minister Netanyahu give this speech primarily about 1938 and Iran is Germany? To American Jews. So part of the implications of this whole story is that part of the reason the Auschwitz paradigm is alive and well is ostensibly, and this goes back to what um, Eddie was talking about on the stage uh, a week ago, is partly because that's the message that American Jews seem to want to hear about the state of Israel. For one of the questions we have to ask is, is the Auschwitz paradigm entirely about how we understand the state of Israel, or in what ways do we as the listeners to this paradigm actually implicitly endorse it? Let's put this on the side. This represents paradigm number one, an Auschwitz paradigm which is um, essentially an ideology of isolation, fear, and suspicion. We are terrified of our neighbors because they hate us. We want to fundamentally live alone because there's no choice that we're left with. And it is an ideology that doesn't do any of the work of what David calls at the beginning of the article, cheshbon hanefesh, a self-examination, a sense of responsibility about what we do as a state, in re either in response to those realities or in essence independent of those realities. It, re it represents one um, paradigmatic instinct in the Jewish consciousness of who we are as a Jewish people and as a state in the world. I guess the reverse of it is what we've called the Sinai paradigm. And here I want to look at Exodus 19 as the primary source. A few, and just make a few brief comments because I think this, is the, this piece is maybe a little bit more obvious. And for those of you who have done the work with our I Engage curriculum, this should be very familiar of how do you talk in a language of aspiration Right? That is about what it is that we as the people are supposed to be doing with the Jewish state, in essence almost independent of the historical factors that surround us. The question becomes not um, what do we do in order to survive, but what is survival for? Right? That's one of the big questions that comes out of a Sinai paradigm of once you have a state, what do you use it for? What is the opportunity that you're trying to create? 
And this is why I think I, this is why we picked Exodus 19 as the critical moment, because we're less interested in what happens when the Jewish people actually arrive in Eretz Israel. After all, one of the most surprising, alarming features of the Torah is that the Torah, and it always gets me every time at Simchas Torah, right? You finish the Torah and you start again, and you're like waiting through Bamidbar and Devarim to actually enter Eretz Israel and try out what this whole Torah was meant to be. And then surprise, surprise, Moshe dies, the story ends entirely aspirationally. When we get there, this is what we're going to do, and then you go back to the beginning again and getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden. The whole story of the Torah is meant to be, to be perched on the precipice, waiting to actually go into Eretz Israel, and therefore the entire narrative of Sinai is meant to be aspirational. What are we going to do when we actually get the opportunity to be sovereign? Exodus 19 imagines that possibility even before Matan Torah. Before the giving of the Torah, we are told famously, right? You saw what I did to the Egyptians in verse 4, how I carry you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, right, you shall be my treasure among all people, for all the earth is mine. And famously, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a mamlecha kohanim v'goy kadosh. Right? You will be a Mamlech Kohanim. And what is a Mamlech Kohanim? Classically misunderstood as a gift of betterness or chosenness, but actually a servile responsibility that the Jewish people are supposed to serve in the world. A kingdom that's made up of only priests is a kingdom of people who don't inherit their land. The priests don't inherit the land. They don't serve, they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't own any land in Eretz Israel. They live off the benefit of the other people who live in the land, as long as their responsibility is to maintain the relationship between the Jewish people and God. So a, a, a people in the world who is entirely a mamlecha kohanim is actually ironically only sovereign to the extent that it achieves something in relationship to God. Right? This is not a am levadad yishkon, which is meant to live in isolation from God and other people, surviving solely for the purpose of survival. It is entirely contingent survival, entirely contingent on what the Jewish people do for other nations, because we are a mamlecha kohanim, a nation from among the nations that is intended to do something for all the other people in the world. And so our sovereignty is entirely conditional on the behaviors that we do. The significance of the Sinai moment in Exodus 19 is further played out by the drama of what has to happen on this mountain. You'll, you, we saw this a little bit in, in the piece from A Living Covenant, but the holiness of the mountain is entirely dependent on God's presence on it, right? You could walk on Sinai the day before the three days. You could walk on Sinai the day after those three days. But as I've learned from Yisrael Canol, in the Hebrew Bible, right, Kedusha is entirely dependent on divine presence. So as long, as long as the shofar is blowing, which means that God's presence is there, nobody can actually rise up onto the mountain. The holiness of this experience, of this encounter, is entirely dependent on living with the presence of God. If you don't no longer live, and, and the metaphor continues to Eretz Israel. If you actually go into Eretz Yisrael and, are failure, and fail to live up to bringing the presence of God in your midst, to, to believe that the land is itself significant without God's presence in it is basically idolatry. What will the land do to you if you misbehave in relationship to God? Spit you out. Why is the Torah given into the desert according, in, in David Hartman's reading according to this Midrashim? To show you that it, your relationship to holiness and to God is entirely conditional. If you gave the Torah in Eretz Israel, I might be deceived to believe that this is a permanently holy state of affairs, because God's presence was here once. If anything, what it inclines me to believe is that even with all of the theatrics of Sinai, it is entirely about the fact that God descended on this mountain for this brief moment and challenged us to do something powerful and profound in the world. And if we fail to live up to that expectation to do something powerful, profound in the world, and, and I'll put it in much more sovereign terms, if we fail to live up to the constitution that God gives us, that we're supposed to take with us and go into Eretz Yisrael and live up to, then there's no constitution and there's no Eretz Yisrael. The entire framework of, of Sinai is one of conditional sovereignty. 
right? God, the, the mountain is only holy to the extent that God is on it, and the people are only charged to do this in Eretz Israel to the extent that they live up to those expectations. If they fail to do it, they get kicked out of the land, God's presence leaves to the land, um, and so on. Um, I think that the, when, the, how David Hartman uses this idea of um, this metaphor of Sinai is meant uh, to tell us that the story of arrival to Eretz Israel is never about arrival, but always about getting to. Doing as much as we can to get to. In this respect, a very good reading of the Torah itself. A very good reading even of Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, about two lovers who can never get themselves in the same room at the same time, right? And where the fact that uh, it almost sets up a metaphor that, um, the relationship between God and the people of Israel is never supposed to be about climax, it's always supposed to be about seeking. You're not supposed to fix the problem of Shir Hashirim. You're supposed to always remain in that seeking relationship to the divine. That, when that becomes a story of Jewish sovereignty, when you say, not just because I'm here, everything is done, but what do I have to do in order to make Jewish sovereignty matter? That is the paradigm that I think is meant to be the entire opposite of a paradigm of Auschwitz, which sits comfortably with the notion of survival in it for its own sake. And that's why I gave you the example um, of the Ruth Calderon speech. Um, just out of curiosity, how many saw or read that speech before here, coming here? Fascinating, um, not surprising. When I did this for the lay leaders, it was about a quarter of the room. So there's more work to do, or put differently, um, you got material here that people haven't totally heard. Um, what's telling about Calderon's speech, and I want to look at just the second to third to last paragraph where she says, um, I aspire to bring about a situation in which Torah study is the heritage of all Israel, in which the Torah is accessible to all who wish to study it, in which all young citizens of Israel take part in Torah study, as well as military and civil service. Together we will build this home and avoid disappointment. It's a great line. Right, um, that we ha that 65 years into the founding of the state of Israel is a moment of opportunity to build up, so that w lest we become disappointed, right? Where you are constantly motivated by the question of what do we have to do in order to make this state the one that we want to be, and it's very, to me, very moving that right after she talks about the glorification of the Torah, she mentions her mentor, Rabbi David Hartman, who opened the doors of his Beit Midrash for me and who built the language of a courageous and inclusive Judaism, where at least for the purpose of you know, institutional boasting, she identifies, at least implicitly, and to the extent that we read this as its own text, a relationship between the teachings of this of a story like Auschwitz or Sinai, and, and what it means to live that out in a political, in a political sphere. There was a, um, a very strange article that appeared the day of David Hartman's funeral um, in the Daily Beast on the Open Zion blog um, by a young journalist who wrote about how, for all of his great accomplishments, David Hartman failed to actually produce a legacy. That ex outside, it was a very strange piece, a little tacky on the day of his funeral. Um, that, out, that essentially said, outside of Baca, his Torah never really got rooted. Made sense in Baca, and maybe for some liberal Jews, I mean, she may make reference to that, but it never actually got rooted. And one of the pieces of that was so startling was, um, this was like a great little intertextual reading of a blog post. At the end of the article, she says, um, for all of his great successes, it wasn't his articles and books that were being read by the religious Zionist elite in Israel. Now, when you write on the internet, if you're gonna say something like that, you don't have to say who you're referring to of whose books are being read by the religious Zionist youth in Israel. You just hyperlink that sentence. And if you click on the hyperlink, it leads to Micha Goodman's Amazon page. <laughs> now, so it's bad research, because Micha obviously is David Hartman's student. But if you misread this model of Auschwitz, of, of this teaching of Sinai, because it was entirely done in English and usually to American rabbis as being something that had no impact in the public square, you miss the ways in which that idea has been very much translated into an Israeli political consciousness. And I think Calderon is one of the best examples. As a student of David Harmon, she's essentially taking this idea of the state of Israel is Exodus 19. We don't know what it's going to be yet. 
I don't care about the fact that it's 65 years in, and I acknowledge the fact that I still have to have a little bit of a consciousness of protecting this against the outside neighbors. But what I want to focus my attention on now is what can the state of Israel be, and not always um, what is the state of Israel not. You know, not only protecting and defending it, but turning it outwards. And in many respects, and then I'll end this long footnote, Yesh, the whole election of Yesh Atid, the political party, which was a political party that nobody knew their position about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and continues to be the case, and yet was able to get between a fifth and a sixth of the votes in the Knesset, represented a rebellion against an obsession with protecting the boundaries, and the, fi event, and the final turn towards what do we want this state of Israel actually to be about if and when the borders are secure, or put differently, since we have no idea if and when the borders are going to become secure, let's not delay the questions of imagining what the state of Israel is supposed to be. All of that signals an attempt to try to embody the Sinai consciousness as a model of thinking about what the state of Israel is supposed to mean. With these two models, let's now turn to the critiques, the question of neither. Um, and in this, by looking at sources um, 10, 11, and 13, I tried to reflect to you um, uh, three moments, uh, three reflections right after the revelation at Sinai, which sound to me as though the Bible itself is critiquing the overall legitimacy of the Sinai revelation as a moment that we're supposed to aspire to. There's something problematic with aspiring to this revelatory moment if three things happen. The first, in source 10, that everybody is terrified of it. And the result of everybody being terrified of it is that they necessarily distance themselves, themselves from it. The pedagogy of Sinai is terrible. Everybody is standing there, right? God imagines, and Moshe imagines, that this is supposed to be a kind of erotic wedding canopy between God and the people of Israel. And the people say, we don't want it. We can't live up to it. Living, trying to imagine the presence of God in our midst actually inclines us to want to move back Right? And the result is that who's the only person who can actually confront God and live with God in this moment? But Moses. And what's the outcome of the fact that only Moses can live in this moment with God? But source 11, which is the golden calf. Because the people can't actually live in relationship with God in this moment, they become convinced, and Moses and God are having a, a, a fine old time on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, ignoring the rest of the people of Israel, makes the experience at Sinai totally about God and Moses and totally not about the people of Israel, so much so that they're inclined by this distance to actually try to amount a God who can actually live in their midst. They think this is, a, if you, when you become about trying to make God in your midst, the inclination towards idolatry is right in front of you. The main problem with the aspirational Sinai model is how quickly it deteriorates to a kind of narcissistic self-expression as played out by the golden calf. You think you're bring, bringing God in your midst, you're actually creating your own version of a God to live up to this aspirational idea that you think um, you're supposed to be doing. And it becomes so obvious to God and Moses how transgressive this is in a way that doesn't seem at all obvious to the people of Israel. Golden calf is, a, is an astonishing act of self-critique by the Torah itself of the Sinai revelation and of the belief that the Sinai revelation was in any way sustainable to the Jewish people. Immediately upon the Sinai revelation, they actually can't live up to it and they capitulate um, with a human instinct to actually um, collapse what it is that they were taught. And the final version of this is in um, source 12. Uh, not source 12, source uh, 13. Um, you thought I was pulling a bait and switch. Um, in source 13, it's even more dramatic, which is that even Moses, who's the one who's been in relationship with God, can't actually communicate with the people anymore, so much so there's this great theatrics of having to put a veil over his face in order to encounter the people. In other words, if you thought that the experience at Sinai was supposed to catalyze something for the Jewish people, the consequence was that Sinai became an isolating and terrifying moment that the people had to stay far away from, that made the people feel that they had to compensate for the divine absence by actually making a God in their midst, and most terrifying, it impacted Moses so much that he became a different human being who couldn't be in relationship to the rest of the people of Israel. <laughs> 
he winds up having this embarrassing veil over his face because he can't act, he's been so changed by this experience, which the people were so terrified to encounter that they had to create a sense of distance and space between them and him. When you valorize the experience of Sinai so much, you miss the easy trap with which Sinai falls in, which is that it's essentially unlivable and unsustainable. Think about the whole desert experience is one in which God is providing all your needs for you. Right? That's why you have that silly man. <laughs> right? Everything is being provided for you. What, by what model, in what theological planet is that helpful to thinking about what happens when you actually cross the boundary and live in that place? Why, when I cross the boundary and God is no longer providing everything for me, how am I able to rely on the model of Sinai and being taken care of with a cloud of fire and a cloud of smoke? How am I able to use that as a model by which to actually build a sovereign society? And isn't my inclination to then believe um, that, I, that in order to mount God's presence in my midst, I have to actually create God anew? It's actually a devastating critique through the rest of the Bible. That's maybe the model of Sinai is actually the, the, the perfectly wrong model totally removed from the anthropocentric way in which a Jewish society is actually supposed to be built. I felt um, a little bit when I was in, I went to yeshiva on a mountain. It was like a great, it was like living in a metaphor. Um, and in the yeshiva, when I was studying my yeshiva for a mountain, there was, on, on a mountain, there was always an, um, an impulse that a lot of students felt and many of the teachers felt to believe that Jewish life was perfect on top of the mountain. And as a result, um, every year or so, one or two people would stay forever in the yeshiva, right? It was like you had an incoming class of about 100, and one or two people would live on the mountain because the inclination, the instinct was to believe, as, as we sometimes valorize Sinai, that Torah actually takes place on the mountain, and if you can live there, it's perfect. But the whole central idea of Sinai is not the mountain itself, it's leaving the mountain. Right? When God says, immediately, Moses says to the people, after the revelation at Sinai, go back to your tents, maybe that's the much more significant moment of Sinai than actually the revelation at Sinai itself, which is, can you take what happens in a revelatory moment and turn it into something that's supposed to build a society? The evidence from Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy is not really. It's really difficult to kind of take that Sinai thing and translate it into what actually should be an operative metaphor for the building of a society. So as majestic as Ruth Calderon's language is, what happens when you can't do it? <laughs> what happens when you can become blocked by the political processes to build the aspirational society you're trying to do? Do you allow, for instance, and this has been one of the great problems with aspirational societies, do you allow the perfect to become the enemy of the good? If your whole vision is one of aspiration, does the failure to live up to that aspiration get in the way of real nation building? One might suggest that that may be, you know, in, you know, Yair Lapid, who was, you know, this visionary, almost like a prophet um, to Israelis about bringing this stuff about, suddenly becomes finance minister and in the span of two weeks becomes exposed, right, as I don't know what a finance minister does. I mean, that was essentially his first set of interviews were they picked the wrong guy, right, like way to inspire confidence. Right, so it's easy, you know, it's easy to hold on to power with the Auschwitz mentality. It's much, eas much harder to hold on to power with this Sinai mentality. Remains to be seen whether once you're actually challenged to take a Sinai idea and live by it, where you act, whether you actually are capable of mounting a credible um, public discourse. The other critique that I asked you to look at, which is the critique of um, Auschwitz itself, which is in sources 15 and 16. In sources 15 or 16, we get a critique from within our tradition about the possibility of mourning too much. I think that in some ways we know, and I, I think for those of you who don't like Netanyahu, the fact that I gave him as an example helped to undermine the argument of Auschwitz, but I wanted to make it a textual argument too. We know this to be the case, that having a um, Auschwitz consciousness, actually that too undermines our sense of what it is that we're supposed to do in the world. But these devastating sources, especially this Gemara in Moed Katan, which I'm still trying to work out, um, conveys to us that living in death actually invites death. That if you mourn too much, 
even for profound loss, what you wind up doing is becoming infatuated with being a cult of death as opposed to being a cult of life. That it doesn't invite you at all into thinking aspirationally about what you're supposed to live for, but makes you entirely obsessed with a culture of death, which is a way of forfeiting life. The Gemara says in Moed Katan, which I have to tell you, I, I would never use this text in anything but what it's not about. <laughs> what it is about is about individuals mourning for individuals. I would never use it for that. I'm trying to extract it from its context and, and try to extrapolate what it means when you try to ask this about a society. It's too heartless of a text about individual loss and mourning. But what, what happens when we think of ourselves as a people going through a loss and a trauma? Does this text help us to remind us that when we become obsessed with death and loss, that becomes the entire story of what we're about? Gemara says as follows, Rabbi Yehuda said, citing Rav, whoever indulges in grief to excess over his dead will weep for another. If you weep too much for those you have lost, you will actually weep for another. There was a certain woman that lived in the neighborhood of Rav Huna. She had seven sons, one of whom, one of whom died, and she wept for him rather excessively. Rav Huna said to her, don't act this way. She heeded him not, and he sent to her, if you heed my word, it is well. But if not, are you anxious to make provision for another? If you listen to me good, if not, you will be making preparations to weep for another one. In other words, your obsession with the loss of the, the death of your son is making you, perhaps, incapable of parenting another. It's making you incapable of recognizing the possibility of life, and therefore you are living in a climate of death. He, the next son, died, and they all died. In the end, he said to her, are you fumbling with provision for yourself? An imperfect English translation, meaning, I guess you're now preparing for your own death, and she died. A heartless, unredeemed story about the obscenity of, of, of over mourning. That if you become obsessed with the, with the death that you have in your midst, that becomes the defining story, the defining metaphor of who you are as a people. And this is what makes us ask, if I talk about the state of Israel as though I am in 1938 and in Germany, what am I doing to invalidate the culture of life that actually takes place within its midst? If I say, if, in 1938, in historical retrospect, is inevitable. Right? If you're talking about 1938, what you're saying is the Holocaust came and it will come and it obliterated a major portion of our people. If that becomes the language that I use to describe the society that I'm living in, what I'm basically saying is I am comfortable with being a culture that's obsessed with death. I know that death is coming. The model that the Gemara is basically saying, somewhat heartlessly, in the mouth of Rav Huna is, the minute that you become obsessed with death, you invalidate the possibility of life. And if you become obsessed that this is about to come to you, it probably will. As I said, not an easy text to use in, in, in a culture of mourning, right? Not an easy text to use in a shiva house, right? But what it tries to do, and the Rambam plays this out, what it tries to do is to try to make us concerned with how do we both internalize what you need to do in order to mourn your loss and then move on. I would say, if we play out our metaphor to, to now, that we, especially in the American Jewish community, have an obsessive culture with death, marked by the building of endless institutions, monuments, and memorials to the Holocaust. It is somewhat sacrilege to say it. So, so profound is the culture of mourning in the American Jewish community around the Holocaust that to say out loud, we have too much memorial of the Holocaust, it's like you're nervous that somebody's going to tweet that. Right? That it, and that'll, that'll come back to you. Right? And how many synagogues, institute, how many um, Holocaust memorials do we have in communities where there are not, not nearly enough resources for the building of Jewish life? Right? How many synagogues are actually built on the premise of a Holocaust memorial garden out back? Where suddenly we seem to have lost sometimes the proper relationship between what it means to mourn appropriately and what it means to become a community that's essentially defined publicly by that, that, that which we are trying to remember and institutionalize and memorialize. This is, I think, perhaps um, an extreme interpretation of this Gemara from Oed Katan into public policy language. What, if you become entirely about memory and loss, 
then you are not, not at all about the present, which the Rambam picks up on. The Rambam says as follows, one should not cry over the deceased for more than three days, and one should not eulogize him for more than seven. Right? There's a limit on how much you're supposed to do, and I love the next line. When does the above apply to most people? With regard to Torah scholars, by contrast, everything depends on their wisdom. This is what we might call Maimonides' Maimonides clause in his, um, <laughs> in his language of mourning, right? Just in case you think this applies to me, um, it doesn't. In any case, though, we do not cry over them for more than 30 days, for we have no one greater than Moses, our teacher, parentheses, also my name, Rambam. And concerning him, Tvarim said, the children of Israel cried over Mo Moses for 30 days. And then I think what's more important is that the Torah goes out of its way to say the, crying and the days of crying in mourning for Moses concluded. By putting in that extra language that it actually concluded, I'm not just teaching you that there's a period of time to mourn, but that I'm also teaching you that the period of mourning has to stop. You deliberately must stop the period of mourning, even for your greatest teacher. And if for Moses it was 30 days, then for the rest of us schlubs, it can't, be, it can't be more than that time. We go on. We do not eulogize him for more than 12 months, for we have no one greater wisdom than our holy teacher, and he was eulogized for only 12 months. Similarly, if a report of a wise man's death reaches us after 12 months, we do not eulogize him. This is remarkable. This is not a contingent time of mourning. It's actually a concrete time of mourning. If you only learn about somebody's wit death, even 12 months after the fact, sorry, time's up. In other words, you need an actual fixed period of time to mourn your loss and not just a contingent period of time. And I put this, I say this with humility, the obsession with finding out new stories of, of loss in the Holocaust is a misappropriation of the Rambam. Because it suggests that if I find out something new, it will increase the mourning that I must undertake. Whereas a, a straight reading of the Rambam suggests that perhaps there is a time past which an obsession with the losses that we incurred, even those that we don't know about, transgresses what it means as a people to mourn our loss over much. Rambam goes on, a person should not become excessively brokenhearted because of a person's death, as Yirmiyahu says. That means not to weep excessively, for death is the pattern of the world, and a person who causes himself grief because of the pattern of the world is a fool. This is real life. Esav Soner Yaakov. Even in the paradigm of Esav Soner Yaakov, to become obsessed with death misunderstands that that's how the world works. And to become obsessed with it is mark in the, for the Rambam of foolishness, right? And, um, and so what do we do? Go to Halakha 13, which will be the bridge to both. Whoever does not mourn over his death in the manner which our sages commanded is cruel. Instead, one should be fearful, worry, examine his deeds, and repent. The, the, the spectrum that the Rambam builds for the proper act, culture of mourning is bounded on one end by cruelty, Failure to mourn properly is an act of cruelty, and it's bounded on the other end by foolishness. Over mourning for the, those who have lost is foolishness. What you have to do, and classically the Rambam sets these up as two polar opposite ends where we're intended to live in the middle, is to mourn properly and in a timely way for those we have lost, and then to move on. That, that a sense of loss cannot be the archetype by which a people builds its core notion of self. We can, how, how is it possible that we remain um, 60 years on, 70 years on, the people of Auschwitz? It's inconceivable, because it means that we have overdone on the cruelty side. And how can it be, would it, would it have been the case that we as Jewish people decided not to mourn our loss, it would have signaled an act of cruelty? So what I'd like to do now is look at a last few sources and then take some questions and comments. And I, what I'd like to do is to try to think what it will mean to hold on to these two ideas simultaneously. How are we benefiting from a, a, an appropriate sense of loss that the Jewish people must retain in our midst? And how do we at the same time retain an appropriate sense uh, of aspiration to, a, to, to, to what it is that we're supposed to be at the people, as a people holding these intention that we are perhaps not entirely a people of Sinai, and thank God entire, not entirely a people of Auschwitz, and figure out a way to hold these intentions. Perhaps the most powerful version of this in ritual form comes in this Gemara and Baba Batra, which says as follows. Our rabbis taught the four lines in um, on page 28 from the bottom of the page. Our rabbis taught, when the temple was destroyed for the second time, 
large numbers in Israel became ascetics. And here the Hebrew is telling, Rabu Prushim be Israel. Many people became Prushim. And another time we'll unpack the historical meaning of the fact that the rabbis are critiquing the Pharisees. Not for today. But many people became ascetics, separating themselves from the people of Israel, um, uh, binding themselves neither to eat meat nor to drink wine. Rabbi Yeshua got into conversation with them and said to them, my sons, why do you neither eat meat nor drink wine? They said, shall we eat meat which used to be brought as an offering on the altar, now that the altar is fallen into disuse? Shall we drink wine which used to be poured as libation on the altar, but now no longer? Right, basic argument of, must, must not our lives be radically transformed, especially our Jewish and ritual lives, must not they be radically transformed by the fact that the Beit HaMikdash is no longer standing? Or put differently, must not we as Jews do something radically different in, in 2013 because of the experience of Auschwitz? Must, should not this have transformed our consciousness in ways that in involve our core religious activities as symbolized by eating meat and drinking wine? He said to them, and he begins the, the reductio ad absurdum, critiquing their argument by making it a fool's argument. He said, if that is so, we should not eat bread either because the meal offerings have ceased. They said, okay, we'll eat fruit. They said, we should not eat fruit either because there's no longer an offering of Bikurim and the first fruits. Then they said, we'll eat other fruits, right? I mean, the, this is just being, the rabbis love telling these stories of silly disciples. The same story as the New Testament, right? Very classically, it helps to promote the, the wisdom of the sages by making the disciples look rather silly. But he said, we should not drink water because there's no longer a simchat beit ha ceremony of the pouring of the water. And to this, they could find no answer. So he said to them, my sons, come and listen to me. Not to mourn at all is impossible because the blow has fallen. Again, as the Rambam says, to be a people who fails to mourn is impossible because things happen to us in history. They are devastating and they require that we take them seriously. To over mourn to mourn over much is also impossible. Why? This is important. Because we do not impose on the community a hardship which the majority cannot endure. What's the implication of this? It's not we don't mourn too much because it's wrong, as the Rambam will say. It's because the people can't handle it. This is one of the dominant narratives in the American Jewish community in the education world over the last 20 years has been, what? Too much Holocaust. This is this Gemara. When you give too much to the people that they can't handle it, it's the leadership saying to the people, that's the dominant narrative that you should have, and the people say, we don't want it anymore. We do not issue a burden on the community that the people actually can handle. It's a failure of leadership to become totally obsessed with a narrative that we think is so important, but that the people actually can't handle anymore. Right? This is why, as, you know, at the risk of sounding like a very old man, young people like hope. Right? That, that's not, right? That's not a, the language of be Jewish because of Auschwitz is so devastating because people actually can't handle it. And so the choice becomes not be Jewish because of Auschwitz or something else, but be Jewish or don't be Jewish if Auschwitz is the, on, is, if Auschwitz is the only um, teaching. Skip one line. The sages therefore have ordained thus. A man may stucco his house, but he should leave a little bit bare. I want you to skip the parentheses, which is the rabbis being silly. A man can prepare a full course banquet, but he should leave out an item or two. A woman can put on all of her ornaments, but leave off one or two. Why? For so it says, Imesh kachich Yerushalayim, and so on. And as you see later in the Gemara, it says, whoever mourns for Jerusalem will be privileged to behold her joy. Right? How do you do this? Through small scale ritual acts, which signal that you are not a cruel person, by you've actually remembered these things, you've built them into your ritual life and your communal life. You leave out a little bit from the banquet, you smash a glass at a wedding, which is the source from which this is ultimately drawn, right? But you don't make the mourning more than it actually is, and you create a conditionality by which if I actually mourn correctly, I'm allowed to benefit and rejoice when it actually gets rebuilt. If I don't do one, I can't do the other. If I don't understand darkness, I can't build towards light but I can't allow my entire civilization to be built on darkness. Now, what's amazing about this is that the rituals that the rabbis are describing are surprisingly banal. Leaving a corner unpainted in your house, leaving a little bit of food off of the banquet, right? Putting on a little bit less, little bit less jewelry, 
I think the rabbis know how banal it actually is, because if I actually allowed ritual to get in the way of true celebration, I would be undermining what it is to live alive and awake as a Jew. So I, it's okay to do banal little rituals and memorials. What shouldn't happen is that the ritual and memorialization winds up dominating the ethos of the ceremony itself. There are a lot of weddings at which I've been at, I think possibly my own, <laughs> um, but it was a while ago, um, in which the rabbis will say to the married couple, you shouldn't have the breaking of the glass culminate with mazel tov, right? Because right now, the way the breaking of the glass roughly works is that it's like a timing device that if I, if I smash it, then everybody knows to say mazel tov at the same time. And instead, what you should do is do the breaking of the glass before you sing something like imesh kachech Yerushalayim, because then people will really be able to be in the remembering of the destruction of the temple. I think that's wrong. I think that Gemara is basically saying you can do a small-scale ritual act of memorialization, which is sufficient. That it's not supposed to be about the deep embrace of a sense of loss. You're supposed to have little markers of loss. And those markers of loss are precise, the banality of the markers of loss are precisely supposed to be the mechanism by which you retain some sensibility of loss, even as you're actually building towards something different. Put differently is Mishnah Ta'anit, which is in the Jewish liturgical calendar, which it says as follows. Five misfortunes befell our forefathers on the 17th of Tammuz and five on the 9th of Av. This is very timely to the time of year. Let's just read the ones about the 9th of Av. On the 9th of Av, five bad things happened to the Jewish people. It was decreed that our forefathers should not enter the Promised Land. The temple was destroyed the first time and the second time. Betar was captured and the city of Jerusalem was plowed up. With the beginning of Av, rejoicings are curtailed. Did these five things actually all happen on Tisha B'Av? Elka says yes. Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. Why did the rabbis put all five of them taking place on one day? Because you need a moment of darkness throughout a liturgical calendar in order to not have the entire year be a period of blackness. Because by the time when the rabbis write this in the second century, and until now, there are many more bad things that befell the Jewish people throughout history that you would have an entire year of mourning and, commemora com and commemoration. But locating them all on one particular day is a way of saying, I need one darkest moment of the year in order for the rest of my time to be actually living out the Jewish calendar the way it's supposed to be. The ironic loss of these days of mourning by Jews who only participate in days of celebration also means you never fully understand what it means to celebrate. If you don't have loss, you are cruel. If you don't acknowledge the past, you are cruel. You must have these two things in dialogue with one another. In the late 1940s, when the State of Israel was debating what day on which Yom HaShoah should take place, the Haredim went bananas. And I think they were actually right. The Haredi response was, what do you mean you're creating a new day on which to memorialize the Holocaust? We have a day already. If it's not, Shiva, if it's not Tisha B'Av, make it a Sarabatevet. Find one of these days that already exist, and we use that to locate our suffering and our loss in those moments. When you separate it out, you implicitly are granting the Holocaust a special privilege of place. And what's particularly problematic about the privilege of place that was granted to Yom HaShoah is that it was Yom HaShoah v'Hagvura. They picked the day of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and it was entirely to convey the message that the dominant story that we want to get out of Yom HaShoah is one of resistance rather than loss. It'd be fascinating as readers of this, as modern liberal readers of this, for to see a movement that takes Yom HaShoah back to Tisha B'Av. To say, what does it mean to actually locate the suffering that we understand because it was in our own generations as a means of helping us unlock suffering that has happened throughout Jewish generations that have always been located in this particular day. The ultimate bridge between these ideas of what it means to hold on to some semblance of Auschwitz, even as we live societies that are not about Auschwitz, are encompassed in the three examples that I gave, and there are many more, in Dvarim and in, in, um, in Vayikra, in which the Torah imagines that we're supposed to use the language of our own destruction and loss as a catalyst for a different behavior in the world. The examples I gave you um, are, first, that the entry to Eretz Israel in Dvarim is conditional on you remembering where you were. 
You have to have some sense of history in order to become the people you want to be. Or in Dvarim um, Chafvav, about Bikurim, in, only when you live in sovereignty, right, and you're coming to give the gifts of your sovereignty, your narrative begins, as we know from the Pesach Seder, right, Megnai Lishvach. I have to start with the bad times of my own background and my own history, because that's the only, that's the, the most useful motivation for me, me being able to tell the story of my success. I need to have a narrative component that incorporates my own destruction as a means of catalyzing why I'm so successful at this moment. And perhaps most um, provocatively in Vayikra, which we'll read together, if if a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not wrong him. The stranger who dwells with you, you shall, shall be as, to you as one born among you. And you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Since you once suffered, it creates ethical responsibilities and obligations on you as a people when you become sovereign to take seriously those who are suffering as well. The ultimate bridge between Auschwitz and Sinai is in a public policy that on one hand takes seriously our own suffering as a people and does not merely translate it into a right of our own survival, but translates it into something that creates responsibility on us for others. There's a divide taking place in the Jewish community today between primarily Israeli Jews and American Jews on what's the fundamental meaning of Auschwitz. Is the fundamental meaning of Auschwitz, as more and more American Jews believe, that we are obligated to prevent these things from happening to other peoples? Or is the fundamental meaning of Auschwitz, as many Israelis interpret, that we are obligated to not allow this to happen to ourselves again? And the answer is, yes, <laughs> right? It has to be both. That, that's what Vayikra is about. It says, this, the fact that this happens to you means that you have to have sovereignty. That's the implicit, you're gonna go from this sense of loss into your land, but it also creates obligations on your sovereignty. You not only are obligated to protect yourself, you have a super, super erogatory uh, obligation to take care of and protect those others who are vulnerable. Uh, I wanna conclude, um, and then take some questions, with, uh, with Amos Oz, who has, for those of you who know Amos Oz's politics, a surprisingly um, realistic and prosaic um, paragraph here in a book that was written basically at the same time as David Hartman's Auschwitz or Sinai. I believe it came out in 1981. The book is called Povisham Be'eretz Yisrael, translated poorly as in the land of Israel, still actually a t almost like a timely work of prophecy. Amos Oz walked around Israel, talked to different societal groupings in the state of Israel, and writes a anecdotally driven book that's about the Jewish state and the Jewish people in it. And one of the moments he describes um, is as follows. Let's read it together. This is the place to make my first shocking confession. Others will follow. I think that the nation state is a tool, an instrument, that is necessary for a return to Zion, but I am not enamored of this instrument. The idea of the nation state is, in my eyes, goyim nachas, a Gentile's delight. I would be more than happy to live in a world composed of dozens of civilizations, each developing in accordance with its own internal rhythm, all cross-pollinating one another without anyone emerging as a nation state. No flag no emblem, no passport, no anthem, no nothing. Only spiritual civilizations tied somehow to their lands without the tools of statehood and without the instruments of war. Or in one word, Sinai. We're not about all of these instruments of the state. We're, about, we're a spiritual civilization that is tied to our land that doesn't need these silly, human, perverse trappings in order to keep us down. But the Jewish people has already staged a long-running, one-man show of that sort. The international audience sometimes applauded, sometimes threw stones, and occasionally slaughtered the actor. No one joined us. No one copied the model the Jews were forced to sustain for 2,000 years, the model of a civilization without the tools of statehood. And for me, this drama ended with the murder of Europe's Jews by Hitler. And I am forced to take it upon myself to play the game of nations with all the tools of statehood, even though it causes me to feel, as George Steiner put it, like an old man in a kindergarten. It's an incredible metaphor, an incredible image. Steiner used this metaphor as an anti-Zionist critique. He said, the Jewish people are the people of Sinai. 
They are the people of aspiration. We are the people of the Babylonian Talmud. The fact that we have a state and we have to collect the garbage undermines the spiritual civilization of the Jewish people. Amos Oz takes the phrase and, and, and says, Steiner, you're wrong. I have to be a people of self-preservation because I'm not, a, I'm not, as he says, like a, like a circus performer for the nations of the world trying out a social experiment to turn the other cheek, which Christianity taught and then we were the only people held to. <laughs> we can't be that people. Right? We have to be allowed to be the old man in the kindergarten, to play the game with an emblem, a flag, a passport, and an army, even war, provided that such war is an absolute existential necessity. I accept those rules of the game because existence without the tools of statehood is a matter of mortal danger. It's not moral. I wish it was, but it's mortal. I think I subconsciously changed it. But I accept them only up to this point. To take pride in these tools of statehood, to worship these toys, to crow about them, not I. If we must maintain these tools, including the instruments of death, it must be not only with glee, but with wisdom as well. I would say with no glee at all, only with wisdom and with caution. Nationalism itself is, in my eyes, the curse of mankind. Oz, which I, it's useful to bring in a leftist who says this, is a reminder that any belief in aspiration has to be realistically couched in a sense of the stakes. It's equally perverse to talk, um, uh, to, 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 to model a, a critical take on the state of Israel that doesn't acknowledge what the absence of sovereignty does for the Jewish people. And yet what's equally useful about this piece is that even as he critiques this, the Steiner's kind of moral vacuousness, he also says, don't trap yourself into thinking that those trappings of the state are themselves morally useful. They're only the means by which we survive to do what it is that we were meant to do. So I want to conclude by saying, we have to be in some ways a people of Auschwitz because as the Gemara says, the blow has fallen. This befell the Jewish people, a dev the devastating story of the 20th century. We also have to be in some ways the people of Sinai because that's what we're meant to do. We can't be both and we can't be neither. It has to, our, our story has to be that we as the Jewish people in building the Jewish state you know, it's devastating every time a head of state comes and the story that is told is Yad Vashem. Devastating, right? And this is a David, classic David Hartman critique. But I don't think, and, and you know, Malila told me that um, David gave a talk, uh, one of the last talks he gave here in the Beit Midrash was his anxieties that maybe he overstated Auschwitz, Auschwitz or Sinai too much. The Jewish people are still experiencing a profound trauma as a result of Auschwitz that must be taken seriously, that has to be ritualized in a way that goes beyond museums and built into our Jewish consciousness. But it can't be sufficient. And that can't be the model by which we imagine what Jewish sovereignty is supposed to be about. I'll stop there. I'm going to take a few at a time and then answer. Go ahead. Okay, I'll take um, one more and then I'll... The uh, Holocaust 
You know, all four of these questions kind of hover around the same issue, which is in some ways the rawness of this conversation, which I want to put a little bit differently. Um, and I said this, I said this earlier about um, Kinisala Aretz with respect to the entry into the land. Um, I think, let me put this gently, I think that the Jewish people are only going to figure out how to remember the Holocaust Jewishly when the survivors are gone. So what we've been, we've been actually operating as a community with a language of Holocaust memory that's actually constrained by the fact that people are survivors and therefore, because memory for Jews has always been interpretive. Right? It's always been the process by which I say, this episode happened in the past, what does it mean to me and what does it compel me to do? And when you actually live through a particular experience, you can't be the interpreter of that experience, and you can't be the public policy arbiter of how others should interpret that experience. And that's why, to me, and I'm going to consolidate a few of the questions that were asked here about Akina, or how the Holocaust is supposed to be talked about, um, or even to what extent it's banal or sublime. Right? You take banal or sublime, for maybe the rabbis who lived through the destruction of the temple, it's actually quite profound that there was a corner of their house unpainted. One wonders whether two generations and three generations later, their children and grandchildren even knew why the corner was left unpainted, or the attribution of the corner being unpainted to some story that Zadie used to tell actually amounted the credible emotional response that it did for their grandparents. And nevertheless, they're setting a stage for history. They're basically saying that's enough. It's enough that your corner is unpainted, even if your children and grandchildren won't quite understand the reason that it was there. Um, I know what seems to me the problematic culture of memorialization when I see it. One of them is recently there is a movement to create, um, I wish I was making this up, um, holograms of survivor testimonial so that a group of kids can sit around a table with a hologram of a survivor who's telling them their story. You, know, like you're, you become immortal through a hologram. And the way that it was described is so that <laughs> So that, so that these kids can be in dialogue with the survivor even after he's gone, which makes me wonder, do they know what a hologram is? Um, you can't be in dialogue with a hologram. All you can do is be told somebody's narrative and story. And I wonder even with the telling of stories that are not about destruction and still the telling of stories that are about life, we've done enough to invite people into an interpretive conversation about what those stories mean. I've said, you know, I've given some versions of this talk in other, um, not on Auschwitz or Sinai, but about the culture of memory in other places, and people always ask, what does it mean then? What would be a new culture of memory in a community of people without survivors? And the answer can't be hearing a survivor testimonial when you can't actually talk back to it. What would it mean to create text studies, either on testimonials, where when the minute you put a text in front of two people, you would actually invite them into a conversation in a way that's totally different than the frontal teaching of somebody else's story, which is fundamentally un-Jewish. We don't do it at Pesach. I'm not sure why we should do it at Yom HaShoah. So I, something has to shift. Um, when Hebrew Institute of Riverdale, I think almost 25 years ago, did the, um, their Yom HaShoah Seder, at the time, it was um, actually quite perverse. The idea that you would play act the Holocaust in the presence of survivors is almost unthinkable. But it may not be quite so unthinkable in a generation without survivors when we have to really start being in conversation about what this means to us in a way that is actually doesn't really care about what actually happened. The same way that when we play act the Seder on Pesach, we don't really care what happened, we care about how we are telling that particular story. We'll take a few others, yeah.
center of the narrative that it is going to happen. However we dance, Amalek is going to be facing us no matter what we do. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> do you know anything about uh, another approach of Hartman or Hartman community to Shoah after we know that uh, Shoah is not just a, a matter of, 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 uh, of covenant or not covenant. It's also the question of uh, human, uh, humanity, human nature, or sensibility, j uh, God's uh, justice. Uh, it's, I think it's amazing that, it, that this is not at all there. And about, and about, the, about the moral danger in the, in the translation of uh, Mosos, I would like to know if you, if you have any uh, uh, personal approach to this. Because this is an expression also from the uh, uh, right party's uh, ideology. Jabotinsky spoke about, about uh, the, the moral of the, the Musar Kia Barzeli, the moral, the moral of the strength, of, 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 to be strong. The weak uh, invites violence, and to be strong, a voice works. Mm -hmm. So maybe, I, I'm sure that Amos uh, didn't intend it, but maybe you, you have any new reading about it. Great. Great. So I hear what you're saying and of the generation that is between the not Holocaust in the sense of how we were raised Jewishly. Um, but now that I'm working with teens who haven't over the last 20 years been instructed in the same way I was, where it was very much about Holocaust, and yet, for some reason, when they go to get a fiction book to read, it's most often a story, you know, Number of the Stars or one of these holocaust -y books, for lack of a better term. What fiction books have you seen or do you suggest that we share with our teenagers to learn about what it means to be Jewish beyond either Abraham, Isaac, and Sarah or the survivor child? Okay, so, um, okay, so, um, First of all, on Esav, Sonei, Yaakov, and, and the, Amale the outcome of Amalek, who's a descendant of, a of Esav um, in the Bible. Um, so I thought about using Amalek because it gets actually to the issue that you're talking about. One of the things that's so, stick that's so tricky about the Amalek texts in the Torah is that on one hand, um, you have the expression, ki yad al Amalek bedor dor, right? There is a constant battle between um, the Jewish people and Amalek for every generation, which for some reason the rabbi then move it generations up back to Esav, but it's actually just about Amalek. In other words, it's not inevitable that Esav sonet Yaakov because of Amalek's descendants. On the other hand, the primary lesson that we're taught about Amalek is um, once you're actually safe and secure in your land, it is only then that the obligation to Amalek, to destroy Amalek actually comes about and you're, you're intended to obliterate the memory of them. And I can't help but wonder, and I know I'm being creative with, um, with the Torah here, whether part of the reason why this mitzvah is uh, only when particular outcomes are created um, is a way of kind of forestalling the possibility of ever having to destroy Amalek. In other words, I'm, I am supposed to acknowledge, I am supposed to be a political realist, that there are gonna be people who are um, those who hate me and those my enemies, but when does the actual obligation on me to become genocidal kick in becomes actually stalled by this notion of v'hayaki aniach, that I'm actually being invited into a tension in the tradition to say, how am I ever supposed to be so sure that all of my problems have actually been resolved that would force me to eliminate this, this, um, this cultural enemy? It's like the Mishnah says, a person shouldn't study the Maseh Merkava, the story of the chariot, unless they are wise in comprehending on their own, right? Which is a way of saying, if you think that you are wise in comprehending on your own, you're not, right? You're not a wise person. So it's like almost, a, it's this dance of, you're supposed to have this obligation to destroy Amalek, but I'm, I'm never gonna kind of allow you to feel that you're so secure that you're actually supposed to go out and do it. In terms of the question of, um, are there, is there another way to approach this question about human nature and human justice as a result of the Holocaust? Yes. It's not really my take today. Um, you know, it's certainly not the expanse of the Torah we could be studying and teaching about God's justice in the world. I think it's ver the very particular move that we're making here and trying to expound is whether Auschwitz as, a, as an idea about 
collective political consciousness is sufficient or not, and that's what I've been trying to play out today. Um, the last question in terms of books um, and books for teens. Um, well, this is bad news, um, and this is the prevailing market, and I don't know how it's, it gets changed. When I went um, a year ago through the Jewish Book Council, they do this hilarious thing where they get like 200 authors, and all of the JCCs in the country who want to bring authors, and they make you do a, 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 like a 60-second pitch to all of these JCCs and whatever on what your book is about, and you, the author, have to sit through all the rest of the pitches. So I would say it was like, um, it was like 40% Holocaust books, about 40% cookbooks. There was one book that was a Holocaust cookbook, and I'm not making that, <laughs> which was like, it was like a, it was like a perfect storm, you know, of like a way to, it's like you could really capture the market. Um, and there are very few books that do anything different. Um, and so I, you know, the question is, is the market going to come first or are the authors going to come first? Because certainly there's enough Jewish ideas and Jewish content that could make for great Jewish teen books, but I don't know how many of them are being written, and I would suggest that there may be somebody else here who knows better, and you could put a sign on the board if you know of some. Um, I want to take your question and take it to a little bit different place, though, also, which is that even the language that we use around fact and fiction when it comes to the Holocaust needs to be revised, too. Um, there's a tremendous amount of anxiety. Um, it usually appears on Oprah when someone has fabricated a testimonial, right? as though fabricating a testimonial is the worst crime that we can do to this story in our history. Um, on this, I just want to refer to you to a book by Ruth Franklin called um, A Thousand Darknesses, Lies and Truth in Holocaust Fiction, um, in which she makes the argument, which I think is 100% right, and in the spirit of what we're talking about, that why do we imagine that a badly written memoir is more true than a well-written work of fiction? And it's a, big, it's a big philosophical question about Torah. <laughs> Right, which is, and, and you know, David Wolpe, when he gave his speech about, you know, his famous speech about, um, about the historicity of the Exodus, one of his favorite, one of the best lines that he gave was, um, I don't know if the story is true, but they don't tell stories like that about you or me. And I, right, I wonder whether that's part of the, um, that's part of the issue here. Obsession with the particular truth of the story does not serve us particularly well in being ongoing custodians and interpreters of that story. And so figuring out a way to allow for creativity in Holocaust fiction, even when it masks itself as memoir, may be part of the journey we have to undertake in order to be um, authentic interpreters and transmitters of this story. A Thousand Darknesses. Ruth Franklin. Let me take one last round. Yeah, Eddie. Filled with the exuberance of the Six Day War, and he lived in this country 42 years. Did he ever lose his faith in the project of Jewish sovereignty? Uh, it seemed to me in the, in the Sinai Auschwitz um, article of David Hardy that he's He's, con he's concerned with from whence comes the spiritual and moral, moral energy of the Jewish state, but he's also concerned with the question of from whence comes Jewish uniqueness, and concerned with Jewish suffering as a source of Jewish uniqueness. Do you think he regretted that in part also, that, or, there's, or that there's a way, in a sense, to draw in a sense of Jewish uniqueness in terms of Jewish suffering that could relate to the Shoah that could still be integrated or subsumed under science? Yes, in the green. I just wanted to say, uh, to pick up on what you said about um, Amalek, that there's a strong tradition um, in the Midrash that really blames Israel, um, that really blames us and our short-sightedness and our cruelty to others for bringing Amalek upon himself. That his ancestry, according to Midrash, he you know, tried to be Jewish, tried to be Israelite, tried to come to us, we rejected them. Um, and there's an interpretation, I just know that this is from my thesis, but um, the Maho and Sam, and God says, you know, I will surely blot out that first, it's for us to do the maho. We have to blot out um, those parts of us that are, you know, that are cruel and that are self-centered um, and that, um, you know, that are dismissive and cruel to others. And only then, um, and that only then can, do, can God do the actual, you know, blotting out of all and So that's, that's our task. Right. Yeah, uh, last one. Yeah, uh, last one, Justice. Um, how different are the needs of the North American Jewish community and, and the community here uh, on this, uh, either on the, 
the spectrum more on the, the two things that Auschwitz and Sinai. Um, okay, so f the first question, did he ever lose his faith in the state of Israel? Uh, you know, I can't answer that question for him. Um, uh, maybe you know better. Um, but um, look, uh, we, I was talking with some colleagues the other day. I'm going to say something very speculative, and, and I want to be open to the possibility that I'm completely wrong about it. Um, you know, both David Hartman and Yitz Greenberg have three-stage theologies, right? Um, but for, for both of them, the third stage is very different. For Yitz, the third stage is the Holocaust, and therefore the radically transformed Jewish consciousness after the Holocaust. And for David Hartman, the third stage is the state of Israel. Um, when your third stage is the Holocaust, everything is optimistic. And, and it's actually not untelling that Yitz remains an optimistic theologian for the Jewish people. Um, because almost everything you do is about is the building of life after the Holocaust. When you set as your third stage the state of Israel, um, you can invite a certain depression and um, anxiety because your setup is an aspiration of something that may or may not um, have yet come to pass. I, I, uh, it's heavy, I know. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. That feels like, I, I do think that, um, and you hear it in The God Who Hates Lies, which you hear the pain uh, in The God Who Hates Lies about what the state of Israel um, has become and hasn't become. And it is, it's one of the perils of Sinai. The, one of the perils of Sinai is if you set up towards a sense of this is what we're aspiring to be as a people, you run the risk that you wind up with a golden calf. And does that, in God's mind, that's the reason to blot you out from the earth. Um, uh, the question of suffering without um, suffering as a marker of Jewishness, uh, I, I do think that on a personal individual level, the notion that suffering actually inclines you to act differently in the world is a piece I, I glided over here, but it needs more on, right? That Auschwitz might not just be a catalyst to think of yourself as isolated and different, but sometimes it can also be a catalyst for you to think of yourself as different in the world. I think we allude to that a little bit with the Vayikra and Dvarim texts of because you were oppressed as a stranger in Egypt means you have therefore a responsibility towards others and invites you to seize life as opposed to being obsessed with your own death. Um, the Amalek and self point, I like a lot, like turning it into a kind of a personal theology as opposed to this is what you have to blot out within yourself. But I, the only thing I would issue as a counterweight to that is Amos Os, which is when you make those who hate you entirely a metaphor, you lose out on the Jewish historical experience that those who say, hey, Savson Eliakov, are also somewhat right. There has been a, this has been a, there are, there have been Amaleks in the Jewish historical experience, even as, you know, when you, the minute you say that someone else is an Amalek, you are not only saying that they hate you and want to obliterate you, you're also putting on yourself the right and obligation to kill that person. And so it becomes very, it becomes very fraught. Um, how does this play out differently in the American Jewish community and the Israeli Jewish community? I think I alluded to before the contrast between whether I interpret um, Auschwitz towards a universalistic ethos of, um, of saving the other peoples of the world or whether I interpret Auschwitz as a particularistic responsibility to, for self-preservation. Um, and although it's a little too neat, um, I would basically say this is where I think this has to, these two things have to learn from one another. I think the Jewish people in America do need to learn a little bit more about that sense of self-preservation, that Auschwitz teaches a lesson of self-preservation. And I do think that the people of Israel do need to learn a little bit more about the, the language of Auschwitz as a model for how we take care of and are responsible for all those in the world and not just for ourselves. Thank you.